that seems to be an agreed upon uh, magnitude of the severity of the effects of climate change. That means that if we've had four tenths of a degree of warming so far, there's been about a 4% loss in productivity that would be attributable to that if you take this number. Availability of arable land, I think that we're all aware that uh, there isn't much more arable land to be had. And uh, worldwide, if we think about how uh, the places where arable land is being generated now, it's uh, probably the biggest area is in Brazil, where rainforest is being cut down to grow soybeans uh, to send to China to feed uh, pigs and add more meat to the diet. So uh, arable land, we're right up against the, the limits. And with increasing population, we're not going to be able to compensate for that by growing more, bringing more land into cultivation unless we're willing to to take lands that shouldn't be used. Availability of groundwater, and this is the one I wanted to just to take a couple of minutes to, to uh, talk about this. Um, I think it's a major issue for India, um, and it's one that's talked about extensively in Lester Brown's book, one of those four books that I had uh, listed earlier. So a paper that many of you may have seen uh, published in uh, by uh, Nature uh, a couple of years ago, just using the data from this great satellite and showing the loss of mass in this part of India, which uh, is interpreted as a loss of, of groundwater, just showing that this is a really pervasive uh, thing. And of course, this is, this is the use of wells to enhance the rain and harvest. Another paper, a lot of Indian authors, but the only one I know here on this list is uh, uh, Krishna Kumar, who uh, was a major contributor uh, to this paper. And uh, so the, the water limited tropics here is the focus of it. And the, it's just the shaded areas uh, where, or the areas with color in them, not the shaded areas, but the areas with color which are the agricultural areas of the tropics, and India is included in that. And uh, just a list by country here of the, of the grain production, um, and uh, showing India of, of all the countries in the water limited tropics. India is the most important in terms of grain production because it has a large area cultivated and a large harvest. And the bars here indicate the change in the rate of growth of agriculture uh, from between these two reference periods. This doesn't uh, mean that the uh, uh, productivity is decreasing. It means that the rate of increase is slow. Uh, so, so it's the change in the time derivative. And you notice the prevalence of negative uh, of slowing of the increasing productivity here, and uh, especially in the, in the countries that didn't matter. So for India, they go into a little more detail, looking at the productivity during the two seasons, the, the uh, warm season when the uh, agriculture is mostly rain fed and monsoons, and the winter season, the season we're in now, when uh, well water is playing a major and the, the time series start back at the time of the Green Revolution. And notice that the increase in the production of, of uh, the grains during the winter harvest season has been more dramatic than during the summer. That's because of the use of that's because of more irrigation. And this is where the slowing of the rate of increase is, is also more. This, and uh, you can see here also that uh, during the warm season, uh, during the summer, there is a strong correlation between the productivity and the amount of rain. You get more, better harvest in the wetter years 
Here is uh, a um, graph of the areas cultivated for the warm season, where there, there has actually been a decline for reasons I, uh, I'm not, I don't know. Uh, but uh, during the uh, cold season, what's interesting here is that, uh, so, th so this is the hectares that are cultivated. This is the rate of population growth uh, on this scale. And uh, this is the area that's irrigated. And you notice that uh, the area that was being irrigated was increasing very rapidly until around 2000 or so. And then uh, there, uh, started, people started to realize that uh, there were limitations and the government, I guess, as I understood it, they stopped subsidizing well digging at this point. And you see that the area of the cultivation took a, took a dip as well. So well water is, uh, is critical in the, in the winter. Then they did uh, through a, a uh, set of equations relating moisture fluxes to the primary productivity uh, of, uh, of biomass in the grains, uh, they were able to uh, use data from this uh, satellite, the, the uh, NDVI, that normalized uh, difference vegetation index, a way of remotely just sensing the greenness of the, of the plant. I should have included a figure to show that, but we have Beautiful maps. At, at any given time, we can see maps of just how, how green it is, and that can be translated. That's highly correlated with how much green is growing. In fact, I forgot to mention that. Oh, I guess I didn't. I threw out the slide, but in fact, on a year-by-year -year basis, it's very well. The greenness from the NDVI is very well correlated with the with the grain uh, production from the government uh, figures. And from the grain production, from, from the greenness, you can also get the implied water use. And this curve tells us the amount of increase in water use expressed as if it were rainfall uh, during this time of increasing food production. And uh, you see that there are large areas in the north here uh, where we're seeing um, increases in water, implied water use of in, in excess of 40%. So to support, if this had all been rain fed, you would have had to have a 40% increase in precipitation to support the increased uh, productivity. And of course, there's been almost no change in precipitation. So this is groundwater use again. So the evidence, I think, is quite striking that the groundwater use is enormous. And of course, we know that the water tables are, are dropping. <coughs> you know more about that than, than I do. These are, in their article, an assessment of the status of groundwater in different parts of the country. Uh, the biggest problem in the, uh, the north in the area along the the edge of the dry region. The area where I showed you the, uh, my photograph from a couple of years ago was over here near Varanasi. That's not an area that's been heavily impacted yet, but looking down the road, it, it very well could be. So that's it for water. Just a, a two quick slides on topsoil. Book uh, about uh, global topsoil uh, by one of my colleagues. David Montgomery, um, and uh, he and others in the field claim that the, the rate of topsoil loss worldwide is, is really alarming, and to the point where it's just, it is not anywhere near being sustainable, and there really have to be major changes in agriculture, moving away from these monocultures that are uh, being used now uh, to produce food. And uh, the fact that the, uh, the erosion results in uh, the requirement of more fertilizer uh, being used um, and that it, it contributes
So, and then uh, just mentioned that there are all these other factors that are not uh, directly environmental in the same way that have to be taken into account as well. So, this was just one of the things on this list. I could have, I could spend hours going through other ones, but I don't know enough about them to really do that anyway. So, to come back to our list, then uh, we are seeing, in fact, in, uh, dramatic increases in these collection of extreme events, and so what are they due to? Climate change is a factor, and in some cases it does contribute, but the other things are increasing exposure, so we have a larger world population, so more people being exposed to these extreme events, and in some cases more people choosing to live in places where the extreme events are happen frequently. In the United States, we have a lot of people move in a building vacation homes, which then are subject to, uh, uh, they have to insure, and uh, insurers like Munich Ray take the losses and hurricane So it goes. So that's exposure. But increasing vulnerability is the thing that I, I think is really uh, the thing we have the, the most to worry about. Now, if we consider, like, for example, last summer, when, uh, as I understand it from uh, talking with colleagues here in India, there, there was a real lapse in the rain during July, an, an extensive great monsoon. And it wasn't a problem because there was groundwater, and uh, it could take up the slack of groundwater. But what if there were no groundwater? Then that same event would be much more serious. I, I think that's happening in many ways drought in, uh, and uh, famine in uh, Ethiopia has uh, been exacerbated uh, by all the social conditions there and the, the erosion of topsoil, the fact that they, uh, the farmers were barely making it at all, and then they have a drought on top of that, uh, there is the vulnerability of the extreme. Thailand, the, the building of industrial plants and places that should have been flood plants whether you want to call that exposure or vulnerability, but again, it's, it's not climate change. So I, I really wonder how much of this increase is due to, due to climate change. So uh, it occurred to me to kind of a biological analogy here with the, with the human body. So we think of a, uh, a family of problems that we might think of as uh, that would cause deteriorating health. Unfortunately for all of us, old age is, is one of them, but then, then there are diseases like uh, uh, AIDS and, uh, and uh, uh, or the, uh, the diabetes and, and long-term chronic uh, diseases like that that make people more vulnerable. And I, I would think of that with our Think of the planet here as the deterioration of our topsoil and our uh, roots running out of groundwater and things like that as being uh, like these long-term diseases. And then uh, in the body, it, uh, people who suffer from these diseases uh, will uh, often develop uh, acute problems in just localized areas of the body, maybe one organ. Uh, which, uh, because of their weak immune system, become susceptible to opportunistic diseases, the lungs being subject to pneumonia, for example. And uh, I would think, in terms of a world analogy, I would think that the extreme events in our constant climate, uh, a, a climate even in the absence of climate change, as being like those opportunistic uh, infections. There's a straw that breaks the elephant's back, so to speak. That, that push things over the edge so that um, what would have been just a hard time becomes a, a disaster. And global warming, I think of as, as one of those things that contributes, that, uh, like one of those chronic illnesses, but not the only one. Uh, that that there, there's a whole family of them that we really need to be thinking about. Okay, uh, so then fine framing scientific inquiry around climate change is an awkward way to organize environmental research. And 
at the very nice lunch times. I've been having a faculty club here talking to biologists who are having to put in proposals talking about how their work addresses climate change. That's true across all walks of life in science now. We're having to do things because of climate change. And it, it comes out of this paradigm that uh, is, is very much a part of the IPCC uh, structure. We think of climate change science. I'm not quite sure what it is, but it's the whole body of science that, that supports climate change. And that science then tells us about the impacts of climate change which affect a whole range of things uh, that many people here study. Um, and then, uh, in response to those changes, we have to think about ways to adapt so we can advise policymakers and the public as to how to deal with these forthcoming changes and how to, how to mitigate them. We see policy in the light of that, everything radiating out from this sort of climate-centric model. Well, I was thinking that uh, perhaps here at Bangalore we could get into that model where um, we have this division of earth and environmental uh, sciences here with lots of uh, boxes in it with people doing all kinds of different science and uh, the major blocks of science here that are kind of like the departments or major pieces of departments on the inside sort of branching out into uh, myriad of smaller areas and people talking to each other and coffee and lunch and, and about these different things. And I'm really impressed here with the amount of, of uh, cross-cutting there is between individual people. And uh, so they're all talking to each other like this. But if we're gonna if we're gonna organize in terms of climate change, we better we better get work, uh, see to it that climate is the <laughs> we don't need those other, other interactions. And really, if we're serious about it, we ought to have chaos and the division center right in the middle of things, and every they, they can have the subdivision around the, around the campus. Uh, but I don't think uh, most of you, maybe, maybe there'd be a few people here who would like that, but, but I think uh, maybe we'll retreat to things the way they, the way they are. And uh, we can think of this whole thing as being something like your, your division of earth and environmental sciences. And uh, maybe just to shrink it here. And in reality, it's that bigger entity like that that really relates to the problems of the day, the, the, uh, the things that people really care about, the food security and agriculture, uh, fisheries, forestry, Water, water and air quality. It's the combined interdisciplinary research in, in units like this that can serve a variety of needs. And uh, often these problems will be interdisciplinary. So uh, then uh, just a minute or two to mention that climate change is only one of the factors that bears on environment energy policy. Uh, in the climate-centric world, we have climate change radiating out like this. But in the real world, we have a specific problem like species extinctions. And climate change is one of the factors that contributes to that. But there are a lot of other factors as well. So this is almost like the transpose of the other way of, of organizing it. And uh, so if we really want to organize ourselves to serve policy makers, it seems like it's, we have to be thinking about the way they think about the problem. Again, with energy policy, uh, climate change being one of a number of these, some scientific, some not scientific. So finally, my, uh, is there a better way to talk about the, these things? And I guess my feeling is that we need to tell the whole story. Uh, we have to frame our communication with the press so that so that they know about the, the chronic disease, the deterioration of the environment, not just the climate change part of it, but the whole part of it. Uh, and and, and uh, that climate change science by itself can't hold up the world. We need a broader base here uh, where we, we, we get together as, as an interdisciplinary group um, and, and we, we talk about the full range of problems. And, uh, then I commend these books to you because apart from that one uh, problem I, I mentioned, these are all very good at, at, at getting the, the big picture of the, of the wide problems that we face. And
And uh, so I, I would argue that we should not think about extreme events and mounting losses in terms of this long-term problem alone. There's a mismatch of scales here. This is happening now. This is going to happen over a period of 100, 100 years. What we need to do is match this up with this picture, the uh, deterioration of the environment, of which climate change is a, is a part. Um, and maybe not quite as imminent as 